you have to think very carefully, where's every single dollar going for? What's my cash conversion cycle? How long does it take me to, to get money from my accounts receivables? How long does it take me to pay my bills? And once you learn those things, let's say you build a nice cash flowing business. If you want to go pursue a fast growth, big venture capital swing, feel free to do that. But you're now doing so with kind of better hygiene, better fundamentals than, than I did. I'm really happy to have you on here today. I want to just jump right in and talk about your early days. I know your mom immigrated from Russia when you were a little baby. And I wanted to hear about that. There's, I've got several, I mentioned, I've got several Russian friends here at where I live in Columbus, Ohio. And they're all incredibly entrepreneurial. Um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about your experience coming to the U.S. Obviously, you're a baby, but I wanted to hear a little bit about what your family did and just like this this entrepreneurial gene that I feel like a lot of Russian immigrants have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the short of it is my engine is an outcome of my mother's and my grandmother's experience. You know, they had a very hard life in communist Russia um, for, for many, many years. They were, they are Jews, uh, which you couldn't, really be there. So they suppressed their, their kind of religion right. and, you know, they grew up in whatever way they knew how there, um, they, you know, went to school, they got jobs, but there was a lot of opportunities that just weren't available to them. And you couldn't even really leave the country. You know, you could travel to a few of the neighboring countries, but you were always under watch. They wouldn't let you leave with more than like $50 in your pocket. They wouldn't let you take most of your family if you wanted to travel. So when the Soviet Union fell um, in, in the early 90s, my grandmother came to the U.S. And at the time, you had to go through either Israel or Italy, and you could go to one of those countries as kind of a stopover point to get to the U.S. because there was, a, um, there was like a refugee program. They were offering asylum for, for Jews from the Soviet Union. So my grandmother spent time in Italy living a little in a little tiny studio all by herself. She didn't speak Italian. She didn't speak English. But eventually she got selected for the lottery to come to the U.S. And she had a friend who who lived near San Francisco. So it was kind of the only place she knew in the U.S. She flew there and she started building a little life for herself and saving money so that she could bring my mother over and myself. Um, and if you just imagine when my mother came over, she was 21 years old. I was one. Uh, she didn't speak the language. Uh, she never planned on coming to the, to the U.S. And she left behind, you know, a career. She left behind her husband. She left behind all her friends um, in order to create a better life for me. Right. That was really where the decision stemmed from. She had already gone through her medical school in Russia. So she was getting ready to be a doctor. And... Wow. She had a good life, you know, for her, she'd kind of made it through. She didn't really see any obstacles, but she knew that I would never have the opportunities that I would have in the Soviet Union or in Russia at the time that, uh, as I would in the U S so she moved for me. And I think a lot about their, you know, I think, I do think a lot about their experience. Um, and I think it just like keeps me moving. It keeps me hung humble. It keeps me hungry for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, in a way that, you know, some people that maybe don't have that story and don't have that close family experience, um, may not. My friends have a similar story. They both, their parents were professionals, doctor, dentist. And once they came to the U S you know, that obviously goes away. That's really hard. You're, what did your mom do after like getting, getting to San Francisco, you said? Yeah, she came to San Francisco. So my grandmother was working two jobs at the time. She was uh, working in a restaurant and she was doing, she was working a front desk job at a hospital. So she was also in healthcare in Russia. But once you come over to the US, you lose all of your accreditation. So she had to start over yep. and she was working on getting certified as a, as a, a like a lung therapist. Okay. Um, my mother came over and because she couldn't be a doctor here and she didn't want to go through the seven year medical school program, she found a dental school program that gave you one year of credit if you had 
medical experience in a different country. So she came over with her experience and she did a two-year dental school program. My grandmother watched me during the day when she went to school and then they would kind of trade off uh, in the afternoons. Um, and she became a dentist. And that's, that's actually how she met my stepdad as well, uh, was, was in dental school. Fascinating. So uh, did you have an entrepreneurial, did, did you have side hustles as a kid as you were growing up? Did you do any, I don't know, mow lawns or anything like that? When did the entrepreneurial you know, gene kick in for you? You know, I never really thought of entrepreneurship until later in life. And if I look back, I can probably trace the dots and say, yeah, I had some entrepreneurial energy. You know, I was thinking kind of creatively. I was tinkering, tinkering around. I was always looking for ways to make money. Um, but, you know, both of my parents were, or both of my parents were not entrepreneurs. You know, they came from the Soviet Union where everybody worked for the government. So there was never this idea of, hey, you can start a business, you can own your own business, you can grow it. The only concept that my parents really knew was be a doctor, be an engineer, be a lawyer, and work for someone else. And right. as long as you could get a good degree and a good education, things were going to work out. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't learn about this idea of entrepreneurship until college. I, I took a, I was actually studying pre-med for a couple of years, and I thought I wanted to be a doctor or a veterinarian. I wasn't sure. Um, but you know, some of the classes just really weren't doing it for me. I, I was doing fine, but I just wasn't having fun. I wasn't enjoying it. And it, that led me to start thinking about other careers for the first time. So I took a class in the entrepreneurship department at my school, just cause a friend had recommended it to me. And it was taught by a guy named John Greathouse, who is this incredible entrepreneur. He's built a couple of different businesses. He started one of the first companies that was doing like robotic arms and healthcare. And then he started another company, which was doing WebEx effectively. It was called, uh, they sold a business to Citrix online called go to meeting and go to my PC. Um, so he taught this class at my college at UC Santa Barbara, and it was the first kind of practical learning class that I'd ever taken. Everything else at UC Santa Barbara is research based, research focused and highly academic. So you don't really learn practical skills. You learn a lot of theory, um, which as an entre as like a red blooded entrepreneur now that used to drive me nuts. So maybe that, that was one indicator was I, I just couldn't handle the gun research theoretical side of school, but this was the first class that was practical. It was hands-on and he really encouraged you to think of real life business solutions, he gave you the skills on how to do it. And then he pushed you to, to start that business or participate in the business plan competition which I did. So that was the first opportunity where I had my eyes open to business. Um, he would invite his friends over who were also entrepreneurs and they would talk about their, their kind of feats and their journeys and their stories of starting a company, raising capital, um, building something, hiring people that they wanted to hire. And I just got super fired up about it. I remember I would sit in the front of the class, which I never did. I took a bunch of notes. I got a great grade in that class. And that kind of set me off onto this entrepreneurial journey of tinkering with businesses. And it led me to start my first education business, so first software education business, um, which is, that must have been my sophomore year of, of college. So was that part of this entrepreneurial comp competition that you did in this class? Or was that totally separate? Was that Study Soup? Because I know you st started a company, Study Soup. I don't know if that is what you're referring to, but... I want to hear a little bit about study soup for sure. Yeah. So my sophomore year, as I was kind of opening my mind to this idea of starting your own business, I started, you know, his advice was the, the teacher's advice was basically work on something that you know, and you understand. Right. And at the time I'm a sophomore in college, so I didn't understand a lot of things, you know, maybe my world was a few very simple things, right? It was family, it was music, it was school and parties uh, and sports as well. So I, I started just trying to solve my own problem. And one of the problems that I noticed at the time was I was living off campus and I was biking to campus with all of my like textbooks and my laptop. And it was so heavy because I'd have to carry it around all day. I wanted, I didn't want to leave campus because I lived so far off of campus. 
uh, I, I lived so far away from class. And I started thinking, you know, why aren't all of my, why can't I access all of my materials and all of my textbooks directly on my laptop? This is before there were ebooks. This is before everything was accessed online. Mm-hmm. Now, now we're in a different world. But at the time, as you can imagine, I was carrying like three textbooks, notebooks, and my big old laptop. Loaded down. Um, yeah, exactly. So this was the this was really the first idea. And I went to a buddy of mine who was a software engineer. And I said, hey, I don't know anything about building a software company, but will you help me build the software? And then I'll go sell it to university professors. I'll sell it to the school. And we'll, we'll create this course delivery solution for people's ebooks, for their readings, for their class notes. Um, and at first we called it Studiously. Um, and we went about selling this software and it was incredibly hard. Most universities do not want to buy a rinky dick, dick software from two guys, you know, working on it in the attic of their dorm, basically, which is yeah. what we were. Um, so we worked on that for an, a year and a half. We got a little bit of progress, but it was like pushing a boulder up hills incredibly hard. And then uh, we decided to pivot the business. We said, hey, let's stay in education, but what other solution can we provide to students? And we came up with this idea of helping students sell their class notes directly on our website. Uh, we noticed that you know people are sharing notes, people are selling, sent, sharing study guides, people are helping each other study in school. How can we bring that online? How can we get people paid for uh, participating in that behavior? And that's what Study Suit became. And the fun thing was that as soon as we pivoted, we got to finally see what good product market fit looked like because the business just took off. Instead of mm-hmm. pushing a boulder uphill, students were coming to us and sales were happening pretty easily. And in the first six months, I think we made more money than we had ever made in the first business. Were you just at... UC Santa Barbara, or were you at other campuses as well? Did you try to, did you grow? Yeah. So, you know, right out the gate, we knew we wanted to grow. So instead of testing it at UC Santa Barbara only, uh, the first semester we tried at UC Santa Barbara, University of Oregon, and University of Washington. It's kind of funny to think back on these days, man. Um, Yeah. I, I remember those two schools, or those three schools being very important parts of our business. So we knew we wanted to grow and we knew that if we made it work at UC Santa Barbara, you know, we may consider it a fluke. Right? We obviously had a bunch of connections, a bunch of friends there. So we wanted to see, can we launch campuses remotely? And we did. And all three of those campuses for us were very successful. Um, and when I say very successful, it was, you know, to the tune of tens of high tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand dollars a year. So after that semester, first semester, we thought to ourselves, you know, this, this seems pretty simple. If we just run this playbook over and over, and I still remember there's 4,000 colleges and universities nationwide. And there's, I think there's maybe like two to 400 of them that are considered like large public state schools, Mm -hmm. um, similar to the ones that we started with. Um, And we said to ourselves, great, like, you know, we're making a few hundred thousand dollars. We're making about, let's say a hundred thousand dollars a piece here. If we go do this at 10 campuses, we'll be making a million dollars a year. If we do this at 100 campuses, we'll make $10 million a year. And this sounds like a great business. This sounds like a great opportunity. So we raised a little bit of money from angels, which was incredibly hard. Um, this was our, you know, this was our first business. We're like 22 year olds. We're going around San Francisco meeting with angel investors and VCs. And um, I had I, you know, I, I got a lot of people who slammed the door in my face, some very kindly, some not so kindly. Um, but after hundreds of conversations, and it really was hundreds of conversations, I was able to raise a little bit of money to test out this, this thesis of ours. And we worked on growing that business from three schools to 15 schools and then to 150 schools. And between three to 15 schools, it worked fine. Like our, our thesis held, it grew nicely. But going from 15 schools to 150 schools, um, things started to fall apart for us. The unit economics changed because we noticed that different schools behaved differently. Some cared about school, some didn't care about school. Um, some schools were big, some schools were small. Some schools were easy to advertise to and others were hard to advertise to. So we kind of got lucky and we caught lightning in the bottle for the first 15 schools, but things started to really slow down after 15 schools. 
And eventually that business hit kind of a, a plateau. We got to a few, maybe like three and a half million dollars of revenue. We were not profitable. We were burning a lot of money, trying to grow and grow big and grow fast. We were, we were excited about that venture growth mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually we realized, man, this, this business is not going to grow. Maybe it'll grow to 5 million, but it's not going to grow to 50 million. And we should slow down. We should slow down our spending to become a profitable company because otherwise we're just going to shoot off a cliff and, and not have money to pay for payroll. Um, and that's when we kind of had a come to Jesus moment. You know, we realized that our original plan was not the one that we set out to what was our, our, our new plan was really not the one that we set out to pursue. We were no longer going to be on this venture growth strategy. And, and we dialed back, dialed everything back. I promoted my COO and made him CEO and, and, I, and I tasked him with making the company profitable. And he did that. Um, and it, that business is still around today, um, which is maybe oh, like 12 years later, which is surprising to me. Um, I haven't been involved with it for eight years, so I can't take any of that credit, but, um, but they're still running a kind of small profitable business. That's awesome. So when you decided to go whole hog into it and, and grow, were, had you already graduated at that point or were you still, were you still taking classes and still in university? Yeah, I had graduated already. I was working at a restaurant at night. So I would work on my startup during the day between like 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. or so, uh, maybe 5 p.m. And then I would go to work at a local restaurant and I would work the night shift. I would work the dinner shift between 6 p.m. and like midnight. And I would do the same thing over and over again. So the the, the waiter job, the restaurant job gave me, an op- gave me the cash that I needed to pay for rent, which wasn't mm-hmm. expensive. I was living roommates at the time yeah and uh, the startup was the opportunity that i was really investing in um but it was a great learning experience you know i think you, you know i think the real takeaway there is there's a lot of young people who get caught up in the excitement of venture capital the excitement of growing a business fast you know tech crunch was kind of at its peak when i was 21 years old mm-hmm. and people were announcing big funding rounds and people were getting celebrated for growing really fast and getting the company sold. So that was the information and kind of the environment that I was in. And I thought to myself, you know, I can do that. I'm going to do that with my current business. But I never stopped to really consider and think to myself, hey, maybe this business isn't supposed to be a venture capital backed business. Maybe this isn't going to be the next Airbnb. Maybe I should just grow a nice, profitable business. I can own the vast majority of it. I can distribute cash flow to myself and my business partner. And then I can use that cash to go start other businesses, invest in real estate. That never once crossed my mind. And it was really just the lack of um, kind of experience, a lack of knowledge. And nowadays, when I get approached by young entrepreneurs, young people starting businesses, I really encourage them to first consider starting a profitable business, maybe a good service business or something that'll just generate cash flow for your life. It gives you an opportunity to learn good business hygiene. You know, how do I read a financial statement? How do I understand what gross profit, gross margin means, which I really didn't know at the time of starting my business. Um, But if, but pushing a profitable business, growing a profitable business really forces you to do that, right? Because if you don't have venture capital or angel money in your bank account, you have to think very carefully, where's every single dollar going for? What's my cash conversion cycle? How long does it take me to, to get money from my accounts receivables, how long does it take me to pay my bills? Um, and once you learn those things, let's say you build a nice cash flowing business, if you want to go pursue a fast growth, big venture capital swing, feel free to do that. But you're now doing so with kind of better hygiene, better fundamentals than, than I did when I, when I started. That's good advice. I love that. I wanted to take a little step back and I know after... At a certain point, you ended up in San Francisco and you were sharing an apartment or sharing something with Sam Parr. I wanted to hear about the San, like that experience of working with Sam Parr at the Hustle. I, don't, I think you guys were working on separate things, but you had day-to-day contact, it sounded like. And at one point, Tim Ferriss showed up. And I, I just think all of this is fascinating. So I wanted to hear a little bit about those experiences uh, in San Francisco. Yeah, sure. So that's a, that's a long time ago now. And Sam is, is a good friend of mine. Um, 
let's see. I was working in San Francisco at a little tiny office by myself on my startup at the time. And I was subscribed to Startup Digest, which I would imagine they're still around, but it was a weekly newsletter about startup news. And I received the weekly calendar. They used to share events. And it basically said, hey, today, Monday night, there's a book club meeting, business book club meeting hosted by a guy named Sam Parr. And I'm a book nerd. Uh, mm-hmm. I love business books. I love autobiographies. I've read hundreds of them. Yeah. And I thought to myself, you know what? I don't have a lot of friends here in San Francisco right now. I, I certainly don't have a lot of friends working on startups. So I'm going to go to this event and see what it's like. Maybe I'll make some friends. Maybe I'll just find some peers who can encourage me to read interesting books and keep me accountable. So I went, I showed up. Uh, it was, I remember it was on the border of Chinatown and uh, Little Italy there, uh, which is North Beach. Um, and I showed up. It was in this like dingy little tiny bar. It was very dark. And there was like kind of like neon lights around. You couldn't really see what was going on. So I went went through the went down this hallway. And at the end of it, there was a small group of people. I want to say there's like seven people there. And I see this guy, uh, this pretty tall guy standing there. He's wearing cowboy boots and a button down shirt. And he comes up and he shakes my hand and he says, hey, I'm Sam Parr. How are you? Um, he's, he's incredibly gregarious and charismatic. Uh, I probably would have left if he hadn't greeted me because it was like so dingy and weird. And there weren't a lot of people there. And I was like, what did I get myself into? I got I to get out of here. Um, but basically what Sam did is he hosted this event once a week. There was a book every single month. Uh, there's a book chosen every month. And he used this book club as an opportunity to meet interesting people, to bring in speakers, to come and talk to us and talk about their books, um, and just to build out his his network and stay accountable around reading. Um, and I thought it was a great idea. You know, there, there are many people that kind of like floated in and out, but Sam and I became very close as well as a couple other people in, in that group. Um, and, um, and, and that's what really kicked off our relationship. So years later, maybe like a year later, um, I had gotten an office in the sunset. I was sharing an office with a couple other guys and it looked like a little apartment building, but it was actually the old office building of Craig Newmark from Craigslist. He oh, had wow. spent 12 years in that office building. Um, so he'd really started the business there. It was just him and a friend. And then little by little, they grew and they took, took over this whole kind of two story apartment in the sunset right off of judo. Um, so I, I moved into that office. I started sharing it with a couple of friends. Eventually they moved out and I reached out to Sam and I said, Hey, you know, we, we have space in our office. I know you're starting the hustle, um, which was a, a media company at the time. Do you want to come share this office? And he moved in with me. Another group moved in with us and they eventually moved out, but Sam and I stayed and little by little, he grew the hustle and I worked on study soup. Um, and we, we became closer over that time period. Um, you asked about Tim Ferriss. So, so Tim Ferriss became an investor in the hustle mm-hmm. and he showed up in the office one day and this is pretty early in Tim's journey. Uh, you know, as a kind of content creator, as being like a, before kind of would, would this have been before the four hour work week came out or right around that time? It was right after the four hour, it was right after the four hour work week came out. So obviously the four hour work week was a bestseller. So like, so he was famous for that. But he didn't really, you know, he wasn't as big on his podcast just yet, which I think is, is kind of his biggest platform now and his email yeah. newsletter as yeah. well, which I think now has millions of subscribers. Um, so he came into the office and I was just kind of lurking around. You know, I wanted to meet Tim. I'd read the four hour work week. I was, I was fanboying. Um, yeah. And he was talking to Sam and I was there just kind of listening in. Um, and I'm trying to think back. You know, he, he shared like a few interesting lessons because Sam was obviously in the early stages of building his media company and he wanted to hear from Tim. Hey, Tim, like, what did you learn building your company? Where's the value? Where does the, where do the economics really accrue for these types of media companies? Um, and Tim shared something interesting that I had not really considered in the past because I assumed Tim is selling the four hour work week. He's making a bunch of money on his books. That's what's really going to make him famous. So he's going to spend his whole life making books and making money off of those books. But what he actually shared in that office is he said, look, 
I make some money off of these books that are bestsellers, but I don't make a lot of money off of it. My long-term game is to build up my own audience. His game was really to build up his podcast and his newsletter. And he said, look, the media does not want to talk about my podcast or my newsletter. They don't care, about it. but they do want to talk about my books. So I'll get invited to do an interview with, you know, Yahoo Finance, for example, and they want to hear about the four hour work week and I'll plug my podcast. I'll plug my newsletter and his book process, his book writing process was really the top of the funnel for his podcast and his newsletter. And I think at the time he had maybe one employee or two employees running the podcast, selling ads, managing all of the operations. So you can imagine if you could run a media business with millions of subscribers with one or two employees, you can have a really profitable company. And for me, that really set off a few different light bulbs. One is it imparted the kind of importance of owning your brand and really having an owned audience. Um, and then two, it really opened my eyes to book writing, right? I'd never considered writing, writing a book, but all of a sudden I, th I thought to myself, you know, if it's good enough for Tim and Tim is using it to build his reputation and build his credibility, maybe I should write a book. Um, and actually I am now finally many, many years later, this is like 10 years ago now, I am now finally in the process of writing my book with a business that we bought called Scribe Media which is a, yeah. a hybrid book publisher that's helping me publish my book. How do you get started with stock investing? I've put together a course to teach you everything I wish I knew when I first started investing in stocks. Let's start at the beginning and ask what is a stock? Let's zoom on in into what it's actually like to buy a stock. A few options are Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, Ally, E-Trade. Fortunately, you won't have to necessarily calculate all of these taxes yourself. I'll outline a few main ones to be aware of throughout your lifetime investing journey. As Warren Buffett says, your best investment is yourself. There's nothing that compares to it. By the end, you'll be savvier about stock investing and personal finance than the vast majority of people. Even if you're not a total beginner, I'm confident you'll get a lot out of the principles and strategies I outline, which we'll build on throughout. A link to the course is available in the description below. See you there. I want to get into that. I interviewed Eric Jorgensen, who took over as CEO of Scribe. So I, I definitely want to get into Scribe later. But before we do that, I, want, I know that you're a big uh, Buffett and Munger fan. You read Snowball, and I wanted to, it's probably a book that maybe you and Sam Parr read in the book study group, maybe, but I wanted to get into like some of your lessons from Buffett, Munger, Snowball in particular. And I also wanted to touch on Rick Guerin um, and kind of the idea of, and you talked about the idea of anti-luck. And I, so let's just get into a little bit about the lessons you've learned from Buffett, Munger, and you now have a holding company that's a baby Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, there's, there's so many lessons to share. Um, so I'll think a little bit about where we can start. So I, I read Snowball, which is a book by Alice Schroeder about Warren Buffett. I must have read that book in 2015. Um, in 2015, I was spending a lot of time in India because we were hiring a lot of staff there for my study suit company, both engineers and academics. And I had a lot of time on my, I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, I didn't have any friends there. So I was really just working and reading. Um, and I read Snowball. And one of the things that stood out to me was that Warren had this holding company called Berkshire Hathaway. And the way it worked for him is he had a few different businesses that all generated cash flow, and he could take money from all of those businesses and pull it up to the holding company and reinvest in the best growth opportunities. Sometimes that meant new businesses, sometimes that meant his current growth businesses. And right around 2015, I was starting to think of study soup. I was starting to see kind of the writing on the wall for, for study soup. Maybe this was actually 2014 now that I think about it. But I was, I was seeing that StudySoup had gone from 
doubling or tripling in size year over year. And all of a sudden we hit a ceiling and the business was still growing, but it was growing at like 10 or 15% per year. Mm -hmm. So it was no longer, um, it was no longer kind of requiring, uh, or it was no longer requiring the type of investment that we were making into it previously. So I'm looking at Warren Buffett's situation and he has multiple businesses where he can reinvest capital however he sees fit. And then I'm looking at my situation and I'm thinking to myself, man, like this little business that I have, it can generate cash flow pretty predictably, but I don't want to reinvest it back in this business. I wish that I had multiple other businesses where I could reinvest this capital because that would be the best thing for me to do as a capital allocator. And this was the first time that my brain went from, I'm an operational CEO to I'm actually a capital allocator. And my job is not only to make sure that the business is running properly, that the trains are running on time and that we're profitable, but my job is to figure out once we have that profit, what is the best thing to do with that incre each incremental dollar? Um, and I think it unlocks something in my head that I was able to access many years later when I did decide to start Enduring Ventures, uh, which is largely inspired by Snowball, largely inspired by Warren Buffett. Um, but it, it really started my me thinking. Like things didn't change for me immediately, but I do remember going through that through that thought process while reading Snowball. Let's get into Rick Guerin. First of all, tell, say you know you can. I'll let you describe who he is, and then some. I know you've had a lot of lessons from him as well. Yeah, it's a really interesting story. Yeah. You know. I think one of my favorite takeaways from the Berkshire Hathaway journey has been the focus on incremental growth and patience. And I, I'm not naturally a patient person. You know, I can be fairly impatient. People say I have a, a pretty relaxed and chill demeanor, which I think is helpful of what I do. But at times I can be fairly impatient. And, and I think that reading about the growth of Berkshire Hathaway, reading the letters that Warren published over the years has really taught me to take my time, not to try to accelerate the desire to make a lot of money today, because I think that's how most humans are wired. You know, if we look at incentive plans, if we look at the public stock market and we think about, okay, there's reporting schedules every quarter and executives are incentivized around stock price and they're incentivized around that reporting cycle. So our entire economy downstream is incredibly short-term minded. People are trying to squeeze the most profits in, in the short term in order to benefit personally. So nobody's acting maliciously, but their personal incentives are tied to these uh, quick growth schemes, basically. And we see the same thing in private equity. So private equity makes a lot of money by purchasing a business with as much leverage as they can and flipping it two, three, four years later for profit. The more leverage they can apply, the more profit they're going to, uh, the more like proceeds they're going to get personally because of the way promote structures work. So Warren Buffett is like a light amongst the darkness. He writes about this idea of growing slowly, limiting the amount of leverage you apply to things, really trying to grow in a way that is indestructible and is defensible because the markets are going to grow the markets are going to crash. Um, it's that is the only thing that's predictable, right? You can't predict the future. You can't predict how the market's going to going to go, but you can predict that there will always be re recessions in the future. There will always be downturns, uh, similar to like what we're experiencing in, in the office market today, right? Nobody could have expected right. the Fed raising interest rates so much and cities getting wiped out. Places like San Francisco, where it was considered grade A. Uh, style commercial real estate is now, you know, 50, 60% vacant. So yeah. we can't predict what's going to happen, but we can predict that something is going to happen. And that's a, that's probably a key learning that I took from those guys is really grow slowly. Don't over leverage things. Don't ever put your holding company at risk of failure, right? Even if it means you have to grow a little bit slower, even if it means you have to delay gratification or delay wealth 
till later on, as long as you continue making good decisions and not losing money for yourself and your investors, eventually things are going to work out for everyone. Um, and that brings us to Rick Gurren. So, you know, when I talk to people, everybody, of course, knows Charlie Munger, who passed away this year, and Warren Buffett. They are the two kind of heads and the figures that led Berkshire Hathaway for the last 60 years. Now, Rick Gurren was the third partner of Berkshire Hathaway. And it's a really interesting story. So Rick first started working with Charlie Munger in his partnership because Warren was over here running Berkshire Hathaway and Charlie had his own partnership early on. And Rick and Charlie would do deals together. And one day Rick discovered blue chip stamps. Basically blue chip stamps, what they were doing is when you would go to the grocery store, you would receive these little like coupons or like gift cards. And you could add up these tokens and eventually you could cash them out for money, for gift cards, for, for prizes. Um, so blue chip stamps was the purveyor. They were the one that, 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 that supplied this, these, these stamps that people collected. And what Rick found was that this business had a, I think it was like a 50 or 70% redemption rate, but they were required to keep all of their, uh, all of this cash on their balance sheet as a liability even though they knew a large percentage of it, people would never redeem, right? They'd been around for many, many years. So they knew what the pattern was. They knew how much of that was actually true cash as opposed to a liability. But they had it all listed as a liability because that's what you're required to do with, uh, with things like gift cards and, and prizes and future prizes. Um, he also noticed that they had like $100 million in public securities. So they were stockpiling cash and investing in bonds and securities. Um, but the stock was trading at something like 60 or 70, the, the market cap of the company at the time was like $60 million. So they have all of this cash on their balance sheet that they're holding back and they're marking as a liability. And they have all of this money in securities and he can buy this, he can now buy this business or 50% of this business for like 30, $35 million. So little by little, him and Charlie bought into this business. And once they did, well, once they got to above a majority, they were able to control the balance sheet of the company. So they spent $30, $35 million to control something like $100 million of capital for this business. And then they, they, and, and they got Warren to invest alongside of them as well into this strategy. And then they used the capital from Blue Chip Stamps to invest in a few states, few of what became like pretty standout companies for them. Um, they invested in one insurance company. I'm blanking on the name. They invested Geico, in the maybe? Buffalo, uh, not not Geico, it was another one, Geico. which it, it, it turned into like a $13 billion company. I'll, I'll remember it uh, shortly. Oh, yeah. Then they invested in the Buffalo, the Buffalo uh, newspaper, um, mm -hmm. which they funded for years out of blue chip stamps, which eventually became a business that was generating somewhere between 30 to $50 million per year of free cash flow for them. And then they sold it for, around $500 million. And then they also invested in Seize Candies. And everybody knows about Seize Candies, but at the time they they paid, I think, $25 million. They paid like $30 million for the newspaper. They paid $25 million for Seize Candies. They put in $30 million into this, this insurance company. And Seize Candies became a juggernaut for them. That business to date has produced about $2 billion of cash flow for them over the years, which is just incredible, right? They, yeah. These guys paid $25 million for a business right. that was generated $2 billion of cash for Berkshire. So this was all Rick's idea, right? He found this, he's an incredible investor, really smart guy. And eventually they agreed to merge the two partnerships. So Rick ends up with something like 5% of Berkshire Hathaway Charlie ends up with something like 10 to 15, 10% maybe at the time. And Warren ends up with the vast majority of it. Um, I don't know if there's a, those are not exact numbers there, but they're, they're within a few percentage points, I'm sure. Now, 17, uh, 1972 rolls around and Rick Gurren is highly levered on his portfolio, on his stock portfolio. Um, and, and towards the end of 1972, there is a stock crash, 1972, 1973, 
there's a stock crash. And because Rick is levered on his portfolio, he gets margin called, which means he has to liquidate most of his portfolio in order to pay down the leverage that he's that he was taking. So he ends up selling his shares back to Warren Buffett for something like $43 a share. All of them get liquidated and, and sold to Warren. Today, you know, if you fast forward the clock, I think Berkshire's trading at over half a million dollars a share. And his piece of the portfolio would have been worth somewhere like seven, $7 billion. So what's the lesson there? The, the lesson is really, you know, and, and, and actually um, Warren got asked about Rick Curran just a few years ago in an interview. They said, hey, you know, you guys used to have a third partner named Rick in the early 70s. What, what happened to him? And Warren shared this incredible lesson. He, he basically says, you know, Rick Gurren was just as smart as Charlie and I. He's an incredible investor. But Rick was in a hurry. And he had these loans out on his portfolio. He was in a hurry to get rich, right? That's why he had these loans out. He wanted to get maximum leverage to get maximum returns. So when he got margin called and he's had to sell all of his shares back to Warren, he lost everything. And that really is the lesson, right? Like you can be an incredibly smart investor, you can be incredibly hardworking, but if you have a systemic risk in your portfolio, which is usually too much debt, um, it can take you down. So the so my takeaway is, you know, take your time, never apply systemic risk to your holdings. You can use leverage thoughtfully. You know, for us, we have zero leverage at our holding company, but occasionally when we buy a business, we'll use a little bit of debt those businesses, right? Because we yeah. think to ourselves, we're going to do whatever it takes to protect those businesses. But, you know, if a few things go wrong and it doesn't work out, we don't want to harm our greater portfolio of businesses. That brings me to my next question. We're talking about Warren and Charlie. I wanted to get into your business partner and the importance of picking the right business partner. So talk about Xavier, if you would, and then whether or not, if somebody's listening to this and they're considering starting a company, whether or not they should pick a partner or go it alone. I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated question. So Xavier is an incredible entrepreneur that I met probably 10 years ago now. I was working on my little business, my little study suit business. And I got invited to a conference for entrepreneurs um, in Utah. It was an invite-only event. There was 150 people. I got lucky. My friend's dad is a well-known angel investor. And he said, hey, you're getting started in business. Why don't you come to this conference? They certainly didn't belong there amongst the people that were there. I was kind of the bottom of the totem pole as far as, no, it's Summit? As far as that entrepreneurs are concerned. Summit series. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so I went there and I showed up and I'm sitting in the house where I'm spending the weekend talking to some of the people who's, who I'm sharing with. And this guy comes in with long hair, he's wearing a suit. Uh, he just flew in from Africa. His name is Xavier. And, you know, over the course of the weekend, we become friendly. We get dinner together. We ski together. We, we, we have a really, we had a really nice time. Um, you know, we always joke that we met in a hot tub because because we went hot tubbing that day. Um, but yeah, so he, he, what I learned about him is that he's an entrepreneur. He's built a couple of businesses. He built one of the largest book retailers on the internet called Better World Books, which he sold. Um, they were processing millions of books per year. Um, and then he started this company in Africa called Zola Electric or Off Grid Electric at the time. And basically what they were doing is they were lighting the homes of millions of people that were off the grid using solar. Really, really cool stuff. And they had like built this like off-grid, decentralized grid technology. Just really, really impressive guy, really yeah. impressive company. Um, and we became friends. Uh, I used to host this founder's dinner in San Francisco with a guy named Sean Puri, who's Sam Parr's co-host now on My First yep. Million. And we used to host this thing called Junto, uh, where once a month That's or awesome. once every two weeks, we would get together 
with uh, interesting CEOs, people that were building cool companies. And it was really our way to get close with people that were kind of further than us in their career who had built cool things and wanted to meet other interesting entrepreneurs. So we would meet once a month. And Xavier, I invited Xavier after that weekend. You know, I thought to myself, wow, this guy's great. He's super kind. He's an incredible entrepreneur. I love the way he thinks. Um, I want to be closer with him. So I invited him to this event that we had in San Francisco. And uh, he started attending. He became a regular with a few other guys that I'm close friends with today. And then many years later, when he had hired a CEO at his company and decided he was going to go pursue a new project, he reached out to me and we started talking and he said, yeah, let's, let's definitely work on something together. Um, and this idea for doing a holding company came about, uh, which frankly he came up with. Um, and, and that's how we got started. So your question was, you know, should everybody have a business partner? And do I recommend having a business partner? Um, Xavier is an incredible business partner. I could have not accomplished everything that we have accomplished to date without him. There's no way. He's really, really special. Um, but I don't recommend business partners for everyone. Xavier and I knew each other for many years, right? I knew how he thought. I knew kind of what made him tick. I knew what got him frustrated. I knew how he behaved in difficult situations because we were meeting and talking about these very intimate uh, elements of each other's businesses. So by the time we worked together, I knew he, that he was someone that was incredibly fair, that he was kind, he was very hardworking, he thought in very unique ways. And that was a good basis for our relationship. That was a good basis for my partnership. The, the challenge with most founders is I, that I see is that, you know, somebody meets somebody in college or business school, or, you know, they're maybe coworkers for a few months together and they decide to start a business together. And they said, you know, I need a co-founder because they're scared and they need someone's help, which is reasonable. And they pick this kind of semi-random person that they're friendly with. The challenge is like, you are basically married to your co-founder. You know, you are spending, you are oftentimes spending more time together than you are with your own spouse. So you should really approach it in the same way that you would in selecting your spouse. And you would never, you know, spend a few hours, you know, most people, most people, I can't say never because some people do, but most people will not spend, you know, a few days together and immediately propose and decide to have children together immediately. Right. Um, and that's what you're doing when you're picking a founder that, you know, you maybe had a couple classes with, or you've known for a few months in those scenarios. What I recommend people do is they play it slow. Don't make any commitments to be co be co-founders with this person. Maybe they're great. Maybe they're not great, but you need more information. So the best thing for you to do, if you can, is to start the business yourself. Um, get things going, get the momentum moving, talk to this person that you're considering working with, suggest that you guys work together in an unofficial capacity for the first six months to get to know each other. You know, if they need a bit of pay, maybe you can pay them as a consultant. And then only after you've known each other for six months and you've worked together on projects, then you can talk about being co-founders or partners in the business. I love it. I love the idea of the Junto too, that you mentioned earlier. That's a page out of, uh, Ben Franklin's playbook, I think, right? Didn't he have something similar that? Yeah, that's exactly that right. Yeah, his version of Junto was not just focused on entrepreneurs. He was bringing in entrepreneurs like industrialists and also local politicians to talk about um, to talk about what was going on uh, with their kind of with society and the, and 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 their town. Um, but yeah, that, that's the idea. It's a similar idea. Yeah, I love it. So. You and Xavier Connect, you create Enduring Ventures. Talk to me a little bit about the portfolio. I want to get into Scribe. I think that was a pretty recent acquisition, um, last three months or so, four months, I think. So talk to me a little bit what the portfolio looks like today, and then I'll, I'll go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, 
So today we own a portfolio of about 20 businesses. We've started a few small companies, but the majority of what we do is we acquire cash flowing businesses from um, owners, from the people who started them. Um, so I guess our world is really split into two. On one side, we're buying good, stable, cash flowing businesses at kind of three to six times earnings. And on the other side, we have distressed or distressed technology businesses that are, they could be profitable, but they have a bad balance sheet or they're not profitable and they, but they have good revenues and they have good product. They just need to be made profitable. So on the value side of the business, on the cash flow side of the business, we own companies in swimming pool construction, uh, plumbing, uh, HVAC. Uh, we have a, like a auditing and accounting product for retailers um, and a few other businesses as well. On the distress side of the business, we have acquired a couple of businesses that were venture back that had raised anywhere between 30 to $60 million. They'd gotten to, you know, 10 plus million dollars of revenue, but they were not profitable. They were both not profitable and they were not growing fast enough to be considered the next Uber or Airbnb. Um, so they're kind of in this in-between space where it's hard for them to raise venture capital, further venture capital but it also doesn't make sense for them to shut down. And in th those cases, we'll come in, we'll buy the business, we'll take it over, our team will parachute in and turn that business profitable. Um, for example, we bought one of our first acquisitions was a company called upcouncil.com, um, which we turned profitable, and then another company called abstract.com, which we run profitably today. Um, and you asked about Scribe, so Scribe, kind of straddles both of those categories. Scribe was once a very profitable business that hit some hard times. And for context, Scribe is a hybrid modern book publishing company. So what that means is if you want to publish a book, Patrick, and you don't want to self-publish, you want a really high quality, good looking book, that ha that's been edited by top editors. You want to get it out into the world and really be proud of it. You could use Scribe to do so, um, and they could even they'll even provide a ghostwriter that'll write in your t in your voice. So they'll do everything for you end to end, everything from helping you figure out what is the exact idea that's going to be compelling for your audience, helping you actually write the book, edit the book, create the design for the product, and then produce it into the world. So they've actually done the book. They've actually published the books of over 2,000 people now. These people are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They're coaches. They're lawyers. They're accountants. Anybody who's looking to build their credibility and put out a high quality product, high quality their voice into the world. Because a book is like one of these things that it lives on forever first of all, mm -hmm. but also it's a constant sales tool, you know? So for example, like I went to a conference two weeks ago, one of the gentlemen there handed me a book and now that book is on my living room table. So I've forgotten mm -hmm. most people that I met at that conference, but I know who he is and I know what he does mm -hmm. and I know what his business is. So it's this right. incredible like perpetual sales tool for business professionals. On the other side, there's customers, there's like famous famous uh, influencers, famous uh, writers like David Goggins, who wrote Can't Hurt Me and sold over 5 million copies using Scribe. Uh, wow. Nicholas, Nas Nassim Nicholas Taleb, Chris Voss, and, and many others. And the reason they use Scribe and is because if you work with a tradition. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the reason they, they use Scribe is if you work with a traditional publisher, that publisher will keep 80% of your winnings, 70% of your winnings. But these guys already have an audience and a reputation. So by using Scribe, they get to control their full IP and they get 100% of the upside. So David Goggins, for example, made many, many millions of dollars more by using Scribe and putting his book out into the world using Scribe. Um, so that's, that's kind of the story of what Scribe is. I'm happy to talk a little bit about the acquisition if, if you'd like as well. Well, I just interviewed 
Eric Jorgensen, and he's the CEO now of the company. He wrote one of my favorite books, actually, which is The Almanac of uh, Naval Ravikant. I love that book. Um, you guys produced it. Just came out with uh, one on Balaji. Uh, so, um, mm -hmm. And then it sounds like you also have plans to write a book, and I'm sure you'll use Scribe. So I actually wanted to get into your idea for your book and some of the thoughts that you have on it. Have you started writing it? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I don't want to give all the juicy de details away just yeah. yet, but I can share what I'm thinking about and kind of what gets me interested in the world. Um, and that will guide what the book is going to be about. So I read a weekly newsletter called the Business Academy, uh, which you can find at sievakazinski.com, just my first last name.com. And the things that I write about are really investing topics, lessons learned in business. And then I do profiles of what I think are interesting holding companies or interesting businesses. So my day-to-day -day is learning as much as I can from other investors, from other company owners, talking to private founder, private company founders, public company founders, and really understanding what has led to the success of the business, what makes their business tick, and building up my internal repository, really sharpening my tool set as an investor so that I can become better and sharper at identifying what is the difference between a good business, a bad business, an outstanding business? And everything we've done so far with Enduring Ventures, everything that I've done so far building my businesses has compounded and led to this. So the intent of the book is to be a synthesis of some of those lessons through the eyes of some of the businesses that I also have explored, right? Can I teach, can I use this as a way to teach as many people as possible to become better at identifying great businesses, to become better at running good businesses, to become better investors, et cetera. You're a great writer. I mean, I connected with you on Twitter. I love your your Twitter tweets, <laughs> X, whatever it is now. Um, talk to me a little bit about the actual, what, what Twitter has done for your career and a little bit about just like your, like creative process in terms of writing and just creating really great content on a consistent basis. It's not easy to do. Yeah. Twitter has completely changed my career and the trajectory of our company. It's been incredible. And it's, you know, for people that don't understand or don't participate, I think it's hard to grasp, right? Twitter seems like a silly tool and like Elon gets a bunch of bad press around it. People are like, what are you doing there? Why are you wasting your time posting and sharing information? Right. And, you know, I can share some of the success that I've had and I, and I will here in a moment. But for me, it really like started to be to share content and share my learnings with through Twitter, through LinkedIn, through my newsletter was really inspired by other great investors. You know, the way I live my life is I think to myself, where do I want to go? Who do I want to become? And I try to learn as much as possible about them and then pattern my life around them. Because these are people that have been doing it for 50 years, right? They've, try, they're, they've tried and tested different methods that work, that didn't work. And there's a reason that 50 years later, they're doing certain things. So for the last 50 years, Warren Buffett has written an incredibly detailed, thoughtful, and thorough newsletter to the public. He doesn't write it in financial terms. You know, he's not writing it for analysts. He's writing it for people like me, people like my sister, people like my friends who can read his writing and learn as much as they can. from it. And if you think to yourself, why is he doing that? Why is Howard Marks producing a podcast? Why is Bill Ackman all over Twitter? These guys are world-class investors and they are world-class content creators. So at some point in their journey, they determined that being a content creator, and building an audience is beneficial and gives them an edge in what they're doing. And it's absolutely true. You know, if you think about, if you've got a big, you know, business that does a hundred million of EBITDA, a family business, and you want to sell it to someone, who's the first person you're going to call? 
you're going to call Warren Buffett, right? And that is an incredible advantage. That's an incredible price advantage because, you know, you could call any private equity firm, you could call, could call any strategic, but he's always going to get the first call because he has spent the time and the energy building his reputation through content. Um, so that's what really inspired me to get started. And that's what really what's encouraged me to keep going, even though at times it feels like, you know, what am I doing? Why am I posting on Twitter? Why am I posting on LinkedIn? Aside from that, I get a huge kick out of um, people reaching out to me and saying, hey, like, you really inspired me to take the jump and start a company, or you really inspired me to go out and buy my business. I learned so much by following your journey. Um, and I love that. I, I get a lot of joy from that. Um, for me, creating content has led to a lot of unique opportunities. It has brought businesses our way for investment. For example, like Scribe came through Twitter from Aaron, actually. Yeah. And if I hadn't been posting on Twitter, there's no way he would have known mm -hmm. who I was. Um, mm -hmm. We raised a lot of capital through those channels. We've never posted to say, hey, you should, you should send us your money. Uh, you should invest with us. But mm -hmm. people see what we're talking about and they reach out proactively and they say, hey, I, I like what you're talking about. I want to invest with you. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, been an, it's really been an incredible tool. And as we grow and as our audience grows and as our experience set gets better, all of this compounds, you know? I have more people who know what we're doing than I did when I had 10,000 followers. And we have more experience as investors. We have more capital to deploy. And if we just keep going and we keep growing along those different vectors, I, I think good things will continue to happen. So I highly recommend it to anyone who's thinking, thinking about uh, building an audience. You mentioned a little bit about the idea of cloning and just basically copying the playbooks of people that have already been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years in the case of like Buffett and Munger. I know you're a big fan of Manish Pabrai and did a, did a thread recently on the Patels who own a, I think over 50% of the hotels, motels in the U S he's got this idea of heads. I win tails. I don't lose too much. Is that a concept that you guys do when you're buying and acquiring businesses? And I'm curious how Monish has kind of affected your thought process in investing. Yeah, the, the Dando Investor, which, which is the book you're referencing, is an incredible book. Um, in it, it talks about the Patels, which is, they're not family members. Uh, it's, a group of, uh, it's a group of people who all come from, I think it's called the Gujarat, or I don't know how to say it, region of India. Yeah. Right. And many of the people, let's say most of them, are named the Patels and are named Patels. It, I think the last name is used as a signifier of what region you're from. Basically, what happened is I think like 60 years ago, um, the first Patel gentleman came to the US and bought a motel. And he used a combination of personal equity and debt to buy his first motel. And he lived in that motel with his family. His wife did the cleaning. He handled the business uh, operations in the front desk. His kids would handle the front desk when he couldn't. And by, he was, because his family was running it, he was able to operate the lowest cost motel with the highest profit margin relative to, to, to their peers, which meant that more often than not, his, his motel was filled. Eventually, he paid off his debt, and he went and he bought another motel. And, you know, and he, and he bought another motel. And when he bought the other motel, he realized, okay, now his family can't run it. So he needed his cousins or his friends uh, from his hometown to come run it. So he invited his buddies from India, and he said, hey, I'm going to buy this motel. I need you to run it. If you run it for a while and you help me... Uh, pay off some of the debts, I will fund you to go buy another motel yourself. So it became this daisy chain reaction of this group of people, or kind of this group from this one region in the world that built incredible wealth in the US through motels and hotels. They own something like a trillion dollars worth of real estate in the US. And I went to a hotel conference called the Asian American Hotel Association recently. And 
99% of the people in that room were Indian Americans. I was, you know, one of the few tall white guys in there. Um, and they, uh, and I met a lot of people named Patels. It, it's, it's a thing, you know, it's a real thing. So anyways, in the book, he taught the, in the down to investor, he talks about this storyline, how this group of people came to this country with very little to no money and through sweat effort, a bit of smartly placed debt, were able to build lasting personal wealth. Um, and, and very specifically, you know, he said, look, like to buy a hotel, you could invest $80,000. You could take an SBA loan for the other, um, let's say $920,000. So now you own a million dollar hotel. That million dollar hotel, if you bought it at a 10 cap, let's say was, was producing $100,000 a year of profit. Now you're running it with your family. So maybe you're making 150 or 200,000, let's say $200,000 a year of profit. So you're quickly pay, you know, so maybe in five years, you can pay off 100% of the debt or a little bit slower if you want. Now you outright owe a hotel that's creating $200,000 of cash flow for you. That's a lot of money for somebody that has no American degree, probably very, very little English, and is now cash flowing this sum of money and owns a property that's worth a million dollars. So the, the real focus there is small. And where can you make thoughtful investments where the downside is limited, but yep. if you are successful, uh, the upside is transformed into your life. And, and it's very much how we think about our business, right? We don't want to risk, you know, our, our, our full capital base on any individual investment. And when we're looking at any individual investment, we're really thinking to ourselves, okay, our downside is of course the cash that we put in, but our upside is X, Y, Z right? Where can this business grow? What is the brand value of this business? What are the cash flow distributions? And we're really looking for cash on cash returns of you know, 20 plus percent. Um, so, um, so, so yes, very, you know, very much so Modish has inspired how we think about, um, how we think about our business. Yeah. I love it. I love that guy. He's got some great talks that he's done on YouTube that I highly recommend along with the Dondo investor. Definitely worth checking out. There's so much more I'd like to ask you, but we are out of time. Unfortunately, is there anything that we didn't discuss that you wanted to touch on at all? You know, I, I think this has been a great interview. You, you asked a lot of thoughtful, interesting questions. I uh, said, so, so we've covered a lot of ground. I would just say this, you know, for people listening, the lower middle market of acquisitions has unlimited opportunities. There's so many small to medium sized businesses out there. And because of the large volume of opportunities out there, you're going to find what I call mispriced gems, right? It's much harder to find a mispriced gem in the public markets because you have tens of thousands of investors looking every day for, for opportunities. Everybody has all of the information. You also have bots and you have mutual funds and you have all of these things that are uh, that are fighting for good prices in the, in the public markets. But at this scale, there's not a lot of buyers. There's a lot of sellers and people are starting to retire at a higher rate as the baby boomer generation retires. So building a skill set, building experience in the lower middle, middle market is, you know, not certainly not easy and it's going to be, it's going to be full of challenges ahead. But if you can figure it out, it's an incredible way to invest and to get good returns um, as an investor. Yeah, it's such a good point. We'll have to wait till your book comes out to learn more about it. But I'm looking forward to that. What's the best way for our listeners to find out about you and get in touch? Um, just my first and last name. It's unique uh, enough that it's easy to find anywhere you, you go. Um, I'm always the first Google search for Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, and, and you can sign up to my newsletter. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, thanks, Eva. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. And almost anyone can be an investor, and money is kind of a commodity. Mm -hmm. And the real challenging thing is to grow and operate a business. And, and that's where like actual value is created. So the way I see being the CEO of a growing small business is this is the most active investing you could ever participate in your life.